You are listening to this week's installment of the Path of a Believer podcast. Hello and welcome back to another episode of our special podcast brought to you by Vasily and Daniel. Uh, this podcast is meant for uh, the Path of a Believer. That we do this podcast multiple times throughout the uh, the month, just for you guys in the Christian home and not a Christian home to share our testimonies, share our life stories, share what God is doing in our lives, and also to impact you guys. Now, guys, in uh, today's video, we do have someone special for you. But before we get to it, remember. If you guys are on YouTube, make sure to you guys to like and subscribe and also comment what your favorite testimony, something awesome that God's doing in your life. We want to read it. We want to be inspired by your guys' testimonies. And also we want to share them, uh, share some of them on our podcast, read some of them, get, get the inspiration out to someone else. Also, if you guys have not watched the first and second videos, they're going to be like right up here. So you guys can just touch them. You guys can watch them. Um, anyways to further on and start up our podcast series in today's episode we have bogdan now bogdan is a wonderful man of of god he has so much learning and so much knowledge that just overwhelms anybody who stands next to him because he loves can't, apologetics you, you can't really argue with somebody who has so much knowledge and so much wisdom um, but it's really nice to learn from someone who has so much knowledge and so much wisdom Definitely. now bogdan i'm just gonna go straight up and just ask how where does all this knowledge where does all this stuff come from how do you learn so much i think it would probably have to credit it to my dad because from a young age he always uh, instilled this idea of um, thinking for yourself in critical thinking or deductive thinking and my earliest memories probably would always be my dad trying to push me to think for yourself and not swallow what other people are trying to feed you but figure it out or in other words discern and ever since then anything that interests me anything that piqued my interest i'd always enjoy reading about it listening about it thinking about it brainstorming well that with me starting podcasts and listening to podcasts and listening to actually apologetics and debates started from you uh back when what was his name i can't even remember but when uh ravi zacharias yes him he was doing a few a few good debates with atheists and things like that which i showed me how to stand up for myself as a christian and to show what i believe in and also uh, the best thing about that is that you also have this thing that you always say like what to say to people when somebody questions your faith why do you believe in god you always tell us to say one thing um but the whole entire uh knowledge all entire foundation all entire thing how does that imply on your belief with god Basically, I wanted to have a personal relationship with with my Heavenly Father and not just be someone who studied God or observed Him from afar or just knew information about Him, but to make my belief my own, not live on my parents' faith or yes. our community's faith, but to make it my own and not to accept what other people believe or what other people teach, but does the Bible teach it? Do we see it in the Bible? And what support does the Bible give for whatever beliefs that we might have accepted? And that's where I started from. Wow. Um, how was your life before you actually like made Christ on this level of, you know, I want to serve you? Well, since I always enjoyed learning and uh, uh, studying stuff, I, I had a good amount of biblical trivia, biblical information and history. But um, when I came in contact with a friend who me and him kind of got along on the same understanding and we had the same opinions and the same thoughts or the same um, interests when it comes to the Bible or even interpretations. And then through some time of you know being friends with him, communicating, just talking, uh, discussing things, he opens up and says that he, he's agnostic, he wouldn't call himself an atheist, but he's agnostic. And that kind of threw me back in the sense of if somebody who thinks the same as I do and uh, tries to go as deep as I do, and if he can have all that information and be able to defend his, his knowledge, I won't say faith because it was uh, 
you know, was, wasn't sure about it. So if he could have all this knowledge, and then when it comes to actually personally and, and uh, applying it into his life and living it out, and he wasn't doing it, that kind of shook me. And I said, well, I need to figure things out for my own now. I need to figure out, do I actually believe it, or is it just, you know, collection of information, facts, and trivia? And that's when my pursuit became where I tried to wipe my slate clean and say, if I believe, or what do I believe, and why do I believe it? Basically started off with the foundation. How I started building it up from there. How old were you when you first made that decision of, Jesus, you are my Lord and Christ of my life? Well, I, I accepted Christ at a young age, growing up in a Christian family. But when I actually tried to make it personal or try to um, live, uh, not, not necessarily live it out because I always try to live it out, but essentially be able to understand why I believe in what I believe. Uh, I was probably my uh, early 20s. Early 20s. Okay. So like 21-ish, 20... 22, 23. Okay. All right. Um, what was your path like into getting into this personal relationship as you describe it with Jesus Christ um, as a father figure versus like this far distant God that so many people usually have this connotation with um, in our faith um, probably whenever we're going through uh, tribulations or just trials in our life we're just you know uh, areas where we're trying to figure things out, especially when you're, you know, a uh, teenager or you're uh, turning into a young adult and you have all this pressure on you and you're just trying to figure out. And a lot of people I know can relate, especially us millennials, that we don't usually have too many people that we could um, open up to or somebody that can really understand us. Yeah, we can share things with them and they'll just listen. But somebody that can actually say, I know what you're going through and be able to be on the same level as us. So I think that la lack of having somebody do that, I just... My dad always instilled, hey, even if I can, you can't come to me, or I might not be able to understand you always, you can always come to your Heavenly Father. And I think that's that, for, since childhood, was instilled in the back of my mind. So whenever I found that I can't have like somebody that I can share with or open up to, uh, when it comes to humans or loved ones or family or whatever, friends, I ran to God. That's, um, awesome. that's, that's a good one. And I have a question because I know we talked about this once before. When that thought or enemy comes into your mind and says, well, how can God be real? How do you defend that to yourself? To myself, um, I basically just look uh, more of the historic evidence from the Bible and the sheer impossibility of it being coincidence. That all this, all this information, all these people and all this foreknowledge just happened to fall into these people's uh, they either made it up or however some other people might try to explain it I, I didn't take it as coincidence so I said so whatever the Bible says has to have some ounce of truth because no other book has stood and had so much pressure throughout the history of human yeah you know, uh, mankind that and still withstood it how many empires how many uh, regimes tried to take it down and every single time the Bible prevails and those regimes fall apart so that started with so the bible has to have something some form of truth or absolute truth to where it can be taken down and once i realized that i just sort of say okay so now I, now it's a matter of me studying the bible and trying to figure out what is it trying to teach us what does it say yeah um we like to share on this podcast kind of for every guest um as much as they're able to share what were some of the up and down moments you had on this path of following christ and how did you navigate around those places where you were down and you felt like the world around you is just crushing you down and um it seems like there's kind of like a sliver of hope but it's so hard to get through that to that place of hope As most humans probably could attest to this, God isn't always in the first uh, first name or the first response you get to run to Him. 
and you know the devil tries to push a whole bunch of um, distractions or substitutes and be like try this this will help you feel better this will you know numb you or whatever and uh, for me it's probably the um, TV or just getting outside of reality you know going into other thinking of all this stuff or you know obviously TV TV shows and you know most of us can attest to that but at the end of the day you know I had that desire to be understood or that to be listened to or to be heard or just somebody just to say I know what you're going through I feel you I've been there myself and Mm -hmm. even at the darkest moments still I ended up having that that thought in the back of my head that was probably instilled in in me by my father was call it Jesus and even you know last last I guess you could say ounce of faith or hope that you, you the person could muster be like jesus help me god i don't know what to do i don't know what's going on and that was basically it was just a simple phrase god help me jesus help me i don't know what's going on just simple ask and, and you shall receive just simply yeah. calling on him and and you might think well that that almost sounds like you know a um, just a phrase that everybody uses oh god help me a cliche you know, something a cliche of some types but when you're when you're feeling the hurt or the emotional whatever you're going through that as cliche as it sounds that still comes from a place in your soul that actually is calling for that and you, your yeah. mental your, your physical mind might not realize that you're actually your spirit's doing it and you might think it's just you know oh, it's just the thing that i've learned but the bible says that uh, the spirit from with groans yeah. calls out groans and aching mm. yes and I think that's that's what. That's my favorite thing about the Holy Spirit. We were talking about this before on a different podcast. With definitely, like when you don't know what to pray, the kicking. Just pray <laughs> with the Spirit. Let yeah. the Spirit talk. It will describe everything that you're feeling, even when you're silent. You can't even pray. Just let it go. And um, this actually reminds me what you guys were talking about how we, how to go through all these hardships and everything. This morning I was reading Nehemiah, and uh, Nehemiah, and he was saying that. It's funny because um, the exact verse, I'm not going to be able to correlate the exact verse, but he was saying that throughout day and night, they had to work with one hand on the wall and the other hand on holding a spear or a sword or, yeah. or something. And then half the people were working, half the people were battling. And why was it like that? It's because when the enemy comes, he comes like a storm, comes like a flood. But I like this. is This is now I'm pulling from um, Nathan Mor- Norris. uh yeah speech from where we did the overhead speech when the enemy comes in like a flood god will raise up a standard yeah you know the enemy always wants to bring doubt shame guilt all these things into your life to pull you away farther away but god's always going to be there for you to raise up the standard in your life like hey you can actually be right here you know the enemy's trying these things he, i'm gonna put you right here he's not gonna be he's not gonna be able to touch you here and the enemy's gonna try to go up again god's gonna lift you up again and this is all through a personal relationship with with, fa- with the father i talking about this the lord's just clicking with me i think this is a good time to bring this in but um so before we were planning to have this talk with bogdan um you know i was like okay we're gonna have it this day where it's planned stuff happened uh long story short um after we recorded one of our podcasts i think it was with phil um the lord uh just told me this while i was driving because i was asking him like lord what do you want us to talk about in the next podcast that you want the people to hear and the lord just simply told me orphans and widows and you know i'm just like okay lord simple um little (laughs) did i know like right after right right before that i sent you a no we were just talking before that and uh i brought up uh jude where it says um no, where does it say? James. True religion. What is true religion? Yeah. It's taking care of the orphans and widows. Somebody that cannot pay you back. Somebody yes. that doesn't have the means to pay you back, but you're able to yes. pay them back for it. That's true religion. It's not religion it's like taking stuff away stuff. It's actually giving to somebody that does not have the means to pay you back. And so basically, I'm like, okay, Lord, I message you and I'm like, bro, whatever we do, Vas, we have to talk about this. So uh, I call Bogdan. I'm like, brother uh we're gonna have your episode recorded he's like i am so sorry but last minute got invited to this conference and little did i know 
it was about orphans and widows. That's the main <laughs> thing. And it was like a really hush hush conference. Didn't know about it. So it's just so divine how the Lord set it up that, you know, in simple obedience, it's like, okay, Lord, we're going to do this. And sure enough, he just, I guess, prepared you um, with all this stuff that you learned at this conference. Um, so yeah, we would like to know um, what you could share about this conference. Um, what are some of the things the Lord revealed to you uh, or changed the perspective on um, in regards to orphans and widows? Um, um, just trying to you know, look back at it. And um, the Bible, Jesus always taught people in parables Mm -hmm. relate a spiritual aspect and related by comparing it to, to a earthly experience or earthly, you know, whatever we see physically. And I feel like when James says true religion is to take care of the fatherless and the, the widows. And in this case, I see it as it's the other way around. When we physically go out and do something yeah, to physically serve the fatherless and the widows, in that, God uses that to show us something spiritual. Rather than taking a spiritual concept and bringing it fit to the physical world, we take a physical action that we do, practice. Yeah. And he tries to see everything that you did and what they're feeling, what they're experiencing, the fact that you care so much for these people. Or when you see them, that they're lacking this and it hurts you and it breaks you. The spiritual world is the same way. And I think all of us would agree is that everybody is a spiritual orphan. Yes. We're, we're spiritually lacking our father um, when we don't acknowledge him and we don't come to him. So the moment that is we so do true. come to him, that's why the Bible uses the terminology uh, adopted you or yeah. um, you are my children. Sonship. Or sonship or the uh, children, of, children of God. So I think that there's so much to be learned when we go out, as James says, to go out and serve these people who can't do the the meekest the weakest the smallest among us we, we go serve them and help them that's where the heart of god is um when it comes to the conference i heard a whole bunch of good and amazing um testimonies and stories of adoption where people go out to predominantly china or even ukraine and um they would adopt kids or the struggles that they go through there was even a pastor from orlando I can't remember his full name his first name is Ronald. And he ended up adopting, I believe, four kids. Wow. And he mildly puts it that he says that any other person, even himself and his wife, said this is just stupid and crazy what they're doing. To take in so many kids into a home where they have their own, might be also, I think, two or four maybe of their own biological kids. And these kids were also a little bit grown up. They weren't little infants. And just such a big clash, I think the terminology used was, a semi truck traveling one way and another semi truck wow. traveling another way, and you get into a head on collision. But he says, after all that, what you learn and what God does in you, and to teach you and to uh, show Him, show us who He is and how He takes care of us, mm. all of that doesn't compare and isn't worth it. And then another um, very interesting uh, testimony that I didn't know, but we've all, uh, we all know Tim Tebow. And yeah. His actual stories is that when his mother was pregnant, before she was pregnant, his parents said, "Hey, God, if you give us another child, we'll name him Timothy." And they said, basically, we want him to serve you, to be devoted to you, like Timothy was. Yeah. Uh, in the New Testament, where he was a uh, a, a minister, and so his mom, his parents get pregnant, and his mom goes to get. Her first checkup, and the doctor says, "Yeah, I don't, I don't think you're pregnant. Uh, it's just uh, a tumor that you've got growing." Wow. She said, and he's like, "We should take it out." He's, she's like, "No, I don't. Uh, that's not what I feel. My motherly intuition doesn't actually so tell me that." So they were saying like she has a tumor like somewhere in her uh, female yeah. parts. Okay, yeah. gotcha. Uh, in her womb that's growing. And she's like, "No, I'm not. I don't think that's what's going on." So some time goes by. And the, the, the doctor's like, it's not a child, it's not a baby, it's just a tumor. Yeah. Some time goes by, I don't know exactly how long she goes for another checkup. And this time the doctor says it's a uh, um, fetal tumor. So oh. It's almost like it's a baby that's forming, but it's not forming. Mm -hmm. 
basically it's, like um, premature or something yeah and it pretty much like a stillborn yeah well yeah and dead, dead baby same thing same same diagnosis you should take it out she says no i don't think i'm going to do that so basically all her most of her pregnancy she's got this great amount of pressure from doctors and other people saying no you should this is gonna hurt you That's and then crazy. They, they eventually came to the point where they were saying if you don't do this you will die wow and throughout this whole entire time she says no i know this is a child and i know this from god because we prayed about it and yeah God's giving us. and so tim tebow actually had the nickname when he was growing up timmy the tumor <laughs> what <laughs> Timmy the tumor. Wow, the and more then the you know. the other thing is, he, when he was born, he was actually pretty small. I think he might have even been born in the premature. I don't know, 100%. Don't That's a big that. guy to be premature, you know what I mean? Yeah, like... but he did say that he was pretty small, and he's like, well, that kind of turned out pretty interesting that he ended up being a, a football player. A football player for, uh, yeah, for the NFL. So that was very interesting to, to hear that story of um, how God is able to to instill this um this faith in us and when he speaks to us and we know it's him we stick to it as timothy's yeah tim's mom did and now all this amazing work that he's doing and calling out um pointing to god and giving thanks to god he actually had another interesting i think another interesting story i don't can't recall all the um details of it but essentially he just wins the Heisman Trophy. Yeah. And he gets sent out to the Philippines, I believe, somewhere in Asia, to speak. And when he speaks there, and he, I think he was, he was, you know, going through so much pressure because he's in this entirely completely different world where he's just traveling around. Everybody is, you know, wants to meet him and wants to talk to him. Plus, he wins this, you know, this such, such highly esteemed award. And he is on a mission trip, standing somewhere in some slums, and he see oh, and this kid comes up to him, and he starts asking for help, pointing over there, and just talking in his native language, and pointing in the direction over there. And people are standing in line, I'm not sure, might have been even standing in line to meet him. And he sees this kid, and he, this kid's relentless, he's not giving up. He wants to draw somebody's attention over it. So finally, they go over there and look, and it was this kid who's malnourished, almost basically on the verge of death, dying because he's just neglected. And I think he was wearing a gator's shirt or some type of shirt that was basically, might have even been Tim Tebow's jersey. Mm -hmm. And when Tim Tebow sees that, and he says, I just won the Heisman. Yeah. I just got a war this great war. And I, everybody wants to meet me. And they want to... Uh, Come to come to and talk to me, and then there's this kid mm -hmm. in a completely end of the world who actually is wearing the t-shirt and has no idea what this t-shirt means or who, what it says or anything. And the fact that he actually meets the kid, the guy behind that t-shirt, and God shows him to say that that that, that is us. We are wow. that malnourished and those and those uh, little children who are in need of Him and His love and His grace. And Such imagery. That. Injury. that Tim Tebow said that that was another one of those moments where he was feeling down. And when that happened to him, that was God saying, what you are doing and what's happening with you in your career, I'm there along with you. And you're doing this for reasons wow. to draw attention to me and to give me the glory. And through that, serve and help so many, as James says, to serve true religions, to serve the, the fatherless and the, and the widows. You know, um, thinking about the fatherless and the widows, um you know how the bible says jesus went through every single basically tribulation hardship that we could imagine or think of and for the longest time i was you know thinking about this whole orphan and widow thing i'm like how could he like experience it right like from a physical human aspect not like you know spiritual father aspect and then it occurred to me, we um, actually talked about this, I think, a while back with Bogdan, um, where, you know, Joseph, Jesus's um, dad that was on earth, he was only there for, I think, till like his teen years. 
and then after that he was just gone uh the bible doesn't really mention what happened to him um however we can imply just from basic inferences that he was gone and you know for me that became a really big comforter um me personally losing my father and it, it gave me this deeper understanding and just sympathy and empathy towards these people who go through this loss and experience this automatic state of like you were with a father and now you're an orphan mm -hmm. and you know for me I, it was kind of hard in the very beginning however you know the lord slowly and steadily um we built this like stronger connection and through that it helped me kind of get into this state of like we were talking about this sonship and going from this orphan heart mentality into this heart of i'm a son who has an inheritance in kingdom and you know the lord's going to take care of my family and everything else that i have before me so i thought it was very interesting that you know the lord just went through that and you know i don't know who's listening to this right now but if you are feeling like an orphan um i just pray that god just touches you and shows you that love of the father and you just accept those adoption papers that he wants to give you um because it's the best relationship that you can possibly imagine and experience with him so yeah that was just something the lord right now um told me to share with you guys um bogdan so you've been christian basically all your life right well you've been growing up in a christian family um and what are some of the skills that you've acquired that have helped you spread god's message um or in general just expand his kingdom um and how, how were the ups and downs of using those skills um, and, you know, spreading God's word through those skills? I think in today's culture and the surroundings that we're in, where we, where we grew up in, obviously in the United States, probably most of the world, with people feeling and having this uh, lacking in their spirit or in their emotion, you know, having somebody they can fully trust for like somebody that's not going to um, uh, betray them or let them down they um, they tend to associate the fact that um, the relationship that they have with their parents or the lack of a relationship with their parents that ends up sticking with with their idea of what a parent is or a father is or a mother is. So whenever people come and hear that God is their father or God is their parent, they automatically, in the back of their mind, through subconscious, have associated all this negative stuff. And everybody can attest to that because our parents are human and everybody makes mistakes and has problems and has their own um, troubles that they're going through. And for some, a lot of people, they... Um, Put their guard up whenever people say god's your father god wants to take care of you because of the pain and um, uh, the pain that they've you know had to go through when it comes to their parents and their father and what i've noticed is that people want to be heard and want to be related to so yeah. if somebody takes the time to sit down and not preach at them because we have enough preachers. Yeah. Right? We have plenty <laughs> That's true. of preachers. That's but true. if you spend the quality time of sitting down and listening to somebody, and sometimes that's all somebody needs, is just somebody to talk at. They just want to get it off their chest. We as Christians understand that we can come to God in prayer, and then God will come and listen to us and give us this peace and comfort afterwards when we call on His name and we're able to get this weight off our chest and lay it on His feet. But when it comes to people who haven't gotten to experience that, and it could even be sometimes Christians, because Christians might have this idea that God's a distant, far away yeah. figure, creator, and he doesn't uh, care that much about me or isn't that much involved in my everyday life. 
So if we show them the caring and that somebody there is out there that is willing to listen to their problems. And we don't have to provide a solution or an answer or help them in those problems. Sometimes people want to start with just listen and having somebody to talk to. And when we show them that, because Jesus says, and they will know that you are mine by how you love one another. Yeah. So when we show that, and when we love one another, if we're talking about Christians, and uh, and ourselves, and the Bible, then Jesus says that love your neighbor as you love yourself. Yes. So that means the love that we have amongst ourselves in our community, if we start sh- uh, having that same love towards the people that are not in our communities, or the ones that are outside of our uh, culture or our little cliques. They will start to see that that person has something that I haven't found anywhere else. And they will be curious to find out what that is. And that is Jesus. But coming up to somebody and preaching to them in the name of Jesus, but without ever letting them experience uh, experience a quality or a characteristic of Jesus by us having it, that's going to turn a lot of people off. Well, it's it's like this um, analogy or um, or imagery of imagine I, i'm coming up to somebody right and i have a product hypothetically um and this product we're calling it jesus christianity whatever not that it it's a product however for the sake of the explanation you're pushing this like hey you need to buy this you need to buy this you need to buy this but the person can never see the the thing he can never touch it he can't even taste it or whatever if it's tasteable and you're just pushing it that's how it is if you're just pushing all this preachiness on them and it's like bro i don't even know what you're selling me like you know so it, it's a total human normal thing to kind of well, react like, to in that sense you know like in my experience in like street preaching and street evangelism like going out and just talking to people and i've gotten into a few long 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 conversations with people where it's just like i didn't have to share god right away i sat down with them just walking sat down had a cup of coffee, had some tea, you know, just outside in the coffee bar, uh, coffee place and just chilling. And we're talking and we're talking and they're sharing me about their life and they're telling me about their life, their, their situations, their situations. And then I tell them about how my life has been with Jesus. And it's not me preaching to them. It's just me sharing. And then I start like I've gotten to the past couple, the past couple of months, actually, or and weeks, especially the past couple of weeks has been a big, big thing in my life to figure out how do I bring someone to Jesus? Okay. Because we bring them to Jesus. And then a lot of times we see this person one time and we'll never mm-hmm. see them again. Like I see most people a lot, of, a lot of times just one time that I preach to and never again. How is it the best way that I can leave a mark? Not my mark, but God's mark on them that they'll come back home and talk to God and know that he's listening. And this is the this is the big thing about like knowing that you know God's there and like I believe that seeds are just put into people and sometimes they grow by themselves without anybody else telling them but sometimes they need multiple people to talk to them you know and and talk to them and like raise them up and so this big question in my life has been like how do I lead somebody to prayer how do I lead somebody to the true repentance how do I lead somebody to the true baptism of the Holy Spirit. How do I do all these things? Because it's it keep, continues to happen, but in all truth, there's no correlation between each moment. It's just spontaneous each time. But how, what's the like? And I keep asking God, God, what's your way? What's your way? How do you want me to do it? And yeah. the Holy Spirit starts to open up individual people need individual means. Yes. You know, individual people mean these me- individual means, but everybody's looking for one thing. You know, you can't touch God. You can't see God. Mm. some people they can't even feel god yeah but god's there and how do you make that invisible unfeelable untouchable god evident in someone else's life that's not there and before i answer i want to hear your answer rog and just to know what you're what you're thinking about that well if we look at the life of jesus we see very uh little instances where jesus came up and approached somebody themselves probably could count uh, you know, in the single digits of uh, times Jesus approached somebody. All the time people were approaching him. So something about Jesus was letting people know that he's approachable, they can talk to him, and uh, 
and talk to him about their problems and he would be able to listen and hear them out. And that's what drew crowds and crowds of them, uh, of people to listen to him. Um, and then the other thing is Jesus, like we mentioned before, Jesus said that they will know that you are mine by how you love each other. So the best example or the best argument you could say for for Jesus is a Christian. And then the worst argument and the worst example to throw people away or it's cast people away from Jesus is a Christian. Uh-huh. I was recently driving by and I saw a bumper sticker that says, Lord, save me from your followers. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. And I think oh, that... Man. The, oh, boy. But in that is, oh, boy. is what the devil does his work. He enters the church not to make the church atheist, but to make it fight against itself. Fight against itself to make it inactive, well, not produce fruit, and worst of all, make the world that we're trying to we're trying to say we can we know somebody that can fix it. We go out there and we do more damage mm. than is already out there. And so the how I would say um, in my life is I and this is a struggle for me too is to be approachable. And to let Christ's characteristics that we see in the Bible, and the Bible talks about, or the fruit of the uh, Spirit, is to have those. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that is what makes people approachable. I know in a couple instances where people came up to me and they said, I've been observing you. There's something different about you. Hmm. Or whenever you start talking. It's the long hair. (laughs) (laughs) The Jesus looking. (laughs) And or when... um, uh, People, when you sit down and you take a genuine interest of how they're doing or how their day is, and you go over, you get, you don't have the small talk necessarily, but you say, how are you really doing? What are you feeling? And it, it never ceases to amaze me. Each time this happens, it takes uh, 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 it takes me even, makes it becomes even more interesting where people even open is within two, three minutes of you meeting a complete stranger. They are on the verge of almost crying, telling their life story, what happened. How many other people out there I'm saying the ones that don't share Christ can sit down with a human being and get them to open up the pains yeah. and the skeletons they have in their closet within a couple minutes of meeting a complete stranger. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. What That's, is it about... Psychologists can't even do that sometimes, yeah, you know? What is it about, you know, it's Jesus? It's Jesus. It's Jesus is what is, is the answer to that. But it's the question Jesus. is, do we Christians, Christ followers, do we emulate? Um, the, best, the best thing that... I have, which is what me and me and Dennis were sitting there, and we were discussing God one night, and God just like touched me to tell Dennis this: press into me, and I will press into you. Wow! Press into me, and I will mark like I will leave a mark on you, something that's visible on you. You know, Moses he pressed to God, and God left his face shining for days on end. Mm. You know. And like Jesus, when he walked off into the wilderness for 40 days, he came out and he was, he was, uh, what's called, he transformed the world in three years. And like, you think about it, it's time and time again, Abraham pressed into God. He's God's best friend. You know, it's just like, what is pressing into God mean? My answer to my own question, in the sense, how do I bring people to such a realization of who God is? It doesn't happen in one instance. It doesn't happen with one talk. Sometimes it actually does happen in one talk, one instance. But majority. for the most part, for the majority, my life, like you were saying, the amount of pressing in that I do to God, the amount of time I spend alone with God, the amount of time I spend learning from God, looking at God, admiring God, talking, worshiping, praying, all these things that you can do by yourself, the amount of time you spend with God, the amount of time you will spend resembling God. Wow. So it's easy for a person, random person to come up to you on the street and tell you, hey, Jesus loves you and have no meaning. But then there, it's a person who carries Jesus that a word having power when you say Jesus loves you or Jesus wants you or Jesus wants to talk to you and like things like that, where it hits them right into their soul. And like this, this word of God that, that you travel and you spend your time with and you spend your whole entire life devoted to God. My best example is my work setting. You know, like I'm pressing into God so much and then I go to work. So where's the first couple hours of me pressing into God for a few hours 
and I go straight to work, those first few hours at work, or actually the, the first couple of days at work afterwards, is like, I'm on fire, I'm living fire, and like, I'm going to my patients, I'm going to my, um, I'm going to my uh, nurses, I'm going to the, the techs, I'm just walking around talking to them, and it's just like, wow, and the best, the best thing, I'm not sure if I shared this, no, I have not actually shared this one, but this is what I was talking. I was spending time with God and I was spending time with God and spending time with God and I was so on fire for God. And I come into work and I'm having this patient and she's, she's having all sorts of problems. And, uh, I just decided to show her a video of what we were doing on worship night the week wow. before. And we were, I just showed her a video of what God put in my heart to make. And so I made the video, I show it to her and it just touches her. I didn't tell her what Jesus is. I didn't tell her how much Jesus loves her, how much like had Jesus died for since I just showed her video. And it was about Jesus being the true baptizer of fire, the holy fire. Like mm -hmm. we need Jesus in this generation to survive through cancer, to survive through the loss of loved ones, all these things. We need Jesus. We need you, you know? And it's just, and I just showed that video about like us just worshiping. It just touched her. And then I had to go. And she was a lady who had so much pain problems and she couldn't breathe properly. And her oxygen was, was at high, high levels. And then throughout the night, I came back two hours later, no pain. Three hours later, no pain. Four hours later, she's sleeping. I'm like, this is amazing. I haven't given her any pain medication. This is amazing. I'm just going by my own. I let her sleep. I made sure nobody was touching her. They all might care about myself. Came in the morning. And uh, she wakes up, wakes up. I help her up to a chair for breakfast. And she's like, Vasily, you know, that video you showed me yesterday, it uplifted my spirit. It just like made me happy. Mm -hmm. It gave me hope because I was always raised a um, Catholic that has a God that we have to fear and so far away. And it's just, it's not, he's not close. But you opened up my eyes to something and it gave me joy. And like, I want your God. Wow. Like those words, Come like, on. I want your God because yes. your God let me sleep last night. Wow. That is so. And my cool. God didn't touch me at all. Oof. And she's like, I want your God. Your God is, is true. And like, it like hit me. And I'm just like, I didn't even talk to her about God. And see, that's, that's the thing. It's like the Lord so often, like, you know, it's so simple. You just shared a video, right? Mm -hmm. Like the Lord, I believe very often. And I started realizing this the older I got and more when I kind of developed this, uh, I should say, personal relationship with the Lord, um, where I started seeing how he gives and set up, sets up these meetings for us specifically to talk to either an unbeliever or be in a setting where there are unbelievers. And the Lord makes it where we have this option of, you know, being bold with our faith and sharing what we the lord has put into us or just you know hindering it and putting it into this doubt box and just letting it bounce off the walls of like and, boom oh it like, could be this it could be this it could be this like or I said this. multiple times like i'm a nurse i i heal people for a living like i go there to heal people physically yeah like, i make sure that they get better i make sure that they you know we get we get them up and running and send them home but I haven't met a single patient that only needed physical healing. Mm. Every single patient that I meet, they need spiritual healing. Their spirit is so broken and so like just distorted. And my other best example of this is I had another lady I was taking care of and she was like, out of nowhere, I was just doing her vital signs. And she was like, do you believe in an afterlife? And I was like, yeah, but what are your views on it? And she was like, well, I just don't, I just can't imagine that all my hard work, all my life that I've been working so hard for. And the best, the best reason that this all keeps happening to me is because I take care of really, 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 really sick people. Yeah. And for them, it's a sliver of a line between life and death mm. most days. And like 90, 99% of people we are able to send home and they're fine. And, but like, it's always a sliver of health. Like one little tap the other way and they're gone and like they have this reality presented to them like you're probably gonna die what are you gonna do with your life now mm. you have a few days left and so she she was like well do you believe in afterlife i'm like yeah but what's your viewpoint on it 
and she's like well i cannot believe that this is it like it cannot be it i was like oh okay well what do you think and just prompting her and this was by the guidance of, of the holy spirit already just started to prompt her i was like well what do you think she's like there's got to be something out there like i know people talk about christianity it's so hard to like just god that's so far away and like how would he, why would he even care about my life all these things and like it just started sparking i was like Come i on. see it coming <laughs> like it was just like i see the lord is making a way <laughs> just like but this is the best thing is that which brings me back to um hosea with strings of gentle love he pulls you in yeah there's gentle loves and these like gentle loves are, are like the strings of taught that he like keeps giving you to you and like he pulls this lady in so close and i'm just like what do I say to like not ruin this moment? <laughs> like what do I say? Because it's and so like, delicate. And my response was yes. For people, they think that God's distant, but when Jesus came to Earth, He made sure to tell us that He's not distant. He's here. The same God who holds the entire universe in His hands, the whole entire thing, is still the same God that looks into you and can actually live inside you and actually help you through every little Amen. thing. Amen. And Jesus did not just come to be distant and be far and be mean and be cruel and tell us how bad we're doing. Jesus came to send us a helper, send us a comforter, send us somebody to get us through hard times because that's what the Holy Spirit's job is. He sent that to us by giving his life up, dying, taking the keys from hell and, uh, from hell and death and saying, no, these are mine and said, Go, went up to live with the Father. Yeah. And sent us somebody that's just like him, that's just like God, and here to comfort us. You know. And the, like this lady, this lady was just like, okay. So I let it sit in her, and I let her dwell, and I let it dwell, and I let it dwell. Next day I come back. Well, how did I get to know Jesus better? I was like, you're already on the right path. <laughs> on the right path. But go ahead. A lot of people don't know this, but basically. You know, we all have this one person who kind of invested into us. Um, you know, you personally, I mean, you working with those people, you're investing into those people. You're that, I guess you could say, maybe first line of entrance or breakthrough mm -hmm. into the devil's territory that he's been conquering in that person's life for so long. Um, and, you know, for me, um, Bogdan has been a good friend of mine and he... Uh, when I was uh, a part of another church, um, helped me grow into the man I am today by feeding these little uh, nuggets, as he likes to call. <laughs> um, nuggets of, of knowledge. Uh, yeah, nuggets <laughs> of knowledge or even questions that were worded in this manner where it made me think and just um, be like, wow, I didn't think of it that way. And, you know, it brings to this way of thinking that you know those simple actions that we all do in regard to every single person that we come in contact with they <coughs> excuse me they affect us in a manner that we don't automatically maybe see the fruit of but eventually with time they produce something which could be 10 times or 20 times fold of what you initially put in place into that ground um you know hypothetically speaking if maybe bogdan didn't see those things into me when i was um younger uh when you know my dad was going through all, uh, uh cancer and everything i could have potentially not turned out the way i am right now i could have you know as we talked about in the previous podcast the lord gave me this ability to understand the situation i was in uh, based on the growth I developed, you know, um, and so this podcast and all these things that we've been doing together, um, they could have not came to fruition. And it's through, you know, Bogdan's simple obedience to the Lord and just doing those things. He probably, I mean, you can answer this. I don't think he knew like the whole growth that would happen to me as a person. Oh, he knew. With... <laughs> so, I mean, just share like some stuff that you um, would recommend for other people who are maybe mentoring 
other young adults, um, what would be some nuggets you would tell them to share with them and have them kind of focus more on? I want to take a, take a little, go back a little bit and take what you said uh, about um, pressing in and how when we press in and then you, you yeah you sorry know. I went on a rant for I just looked back I went on a rant for 10 minutes <laughs> yeah, no that's good it's all good uh, yeah, I get a chance to combine what both of you were talking about and put a little bit of my experience into it um, so when you start talking about um, pressing in and then when you go in the next couple of days and the people around you that uh, interact with you you see God moving in them so, um, and we Slavics have this expression that tell me who your friends are and I'll tell you who you are. Yeah. Or as Proverbs says, good company, I mean, bad company ruins good, good morals. Good character, yeah. And that's the same thing. When we, The harder we press in into God, the more time we spend with Him, the more of His nature, His character flows into us because we're in His presence. So it's almost like we're, we're a magnet and the, we gain a charge from Him. So mm-hmm. when we go out, wherever we go, we emulate this charge off of us. And if we go somewhere where it's negative, we start losing our charge, we start discharging, and we start then turning negatives ourselves. So we always wonder, you know, why do I have such good weeks, such bad weeks? And then most likely if we think back, we are not charging. When we uh, that's negatives. exactly what we were just talking about. If you be right before you came, we were talking about that too. It's just like, I have this, I used to have this big problem. I give so much of everything away, like all this, like I spend time with God, and then my first thing to do is give it give it away. Spend time with God and then just go out and not pour. Spend time with God and go out and not pour. And then there's some days where like I go and I don't spend time enough time with God or I don't spend a whole week with God. And then like I go for like two weeks where like I'm starting to give away. And then like now the Holy Spirit, like for the past year before that, it wasn't even catching on at all. But for the past year, the Holy Spirit has put like this mark. Like if I do not spend time with God, I cannot talk about like god the way i would before and like it's almost like this whole entire consciousness feeling like somebody somebody needs god and i'm just like oh my goodness i didn't spend enough time with god to show them and like it's 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 the same thing i was praying for beforehand this desire god i want this desire to spend time with you how do i get this desire to spend time with you well this is exactly how he did it he said okay i'm gonna put this huge consciousness block inside of you if you do not spend time with me you can't share me Mm. And then if you start sharing me, you start feeling like you're fake, which is exactly what I had before with no subconsciousness to it. It was just me. I was, I was like, oh, I'm just describing my, my relationship with God. But technically, all I was doing was putting more and more of myself rather than putting more and more of God out there. And then when God touched me and he said, I'm done with all this fake stuff that you're doing. Like, why can't you just be true? Like, I want you to be real. And I want, and I want, to, be, I want to be real, too. And the only way I can be real and the only way I can be true is to spend time with God. Yep. We see that happening so many times in Jesus' life. So if we like take a big zoom out and we look at all of like nature and creation and everything we have on planet Earth, none of it is self-sustaining. Yeah. Yes. Everything has a source. Everything relies on something else. So just like um, a combustible combustible engine needs gas to run, it needs a source to combust on. Um, electrical engine, uh, electronic engines need. Uh, uh, electricity a charge batteries need to get constantly charged mm-hmm. everything needs to get plugged in and get its uh, get its life or, uh, you know can be connected to its source same thing with us if we are created in god's image that means we're spirits and if we're not connected to, to the creator or the the spirit himself who created us if we don't connect with him or not plugged in with him we start draining and we see that happen just like how many times jesus says uh, jesus was tired or even when um the, the woman that was sick and uh, you know was sick for so many years with her medical condition of uh, I believe it was internal bleeding and she touches Jesus I feel, yeah. yeah and Jesus says I feel uh, you the know the power drain away from me power left me and then we see every time whenever he go through but, the crowds but 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 right off the bat I just hit my my spark he was going over to heal a dead girl at that time right the power he felt the power leave her leave him. But he still went and healed the girl. Mm. What is he saying between that that allows him to still go and heal well, that girl? Well, I think when he was healing her, he wasn't healing in his name. He was healing in the name of the Father. So he still had connection. 
So he wasn't disconnected from the father. So if he drains, yes. he's no longer able to regain his juice. <laughs> so, and then we see so many times this is, and, and Jesus went away for the night to pray. Yeah. Jesus went into the wilderness. To pray. Or my favorite is uh, whenever he just comes down from the mountain and the dad meets him and says, I brought my son to you, to your disciples. They did <laughs> nothing. Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. Why couldn't they heal him? And Jesus is like, oh, you perverse and wicked generation. Yeah. And it's like, you look back from it, you're just like, why would he ever say that to them? They were trying their best to heal the. But he's like, I spend the whole entire morning, probably, probably since like 3 a.m. Prayer and fasting. Prayer and fasting. Well, you guys were out here doing your thing. If you do not spend the time with God, he said, he said, I only do what I see my father do. I only say what I see my father say. Or I only... I do my father's work. Yeah, I do my, like pretty much whatever you see me do, I whatever I do, I see, I've seen my father do. Or... And like, it's the best way to describe it. You can't do it without the Father or you can't do it without Jesus. You can't do it without the Holy Spirit. It's the best thing. But another thing that just caught my mind, if you guys are in the ministry, if you guys are doing something, if you guys are, are spending, it gets busy. Your life gets busy, especially Definitely. full-time ministry. Your life gets busy and you feel like corporate spending time becomes your personal spending time. Mm. Okay, the best preacher, the best, um, I think it was Andre uh, Shapoval that said, spending time in church is not the same time as spending time at home. Yeah. Sometimes after after preaching, after worshiping, after doing your, your stuff that you do at church, you feel like, okay, I've checked off my spending mm -hmm. time with God and you go. <laughs> Don't lose that one on one personal connection with God because when you lose that personal connection with God it brings us back to what we were talking about before you start showing more of yourself to people than God because you lose that magnet uh magnet amplifying thing that God's giving to you you know like what Bogdan was saying you you're starting to lose that you're starting to get drained and you have no source of getting filled up and yes church is great church is awesome but iron sharpens iron yes not the other way around so to come into church my best thing is what i always tell them and we're, we're going to be wrapping it up so in about four minutes my best thing to, that i keep telling everybody is that if you're on the way to church and you don't feel on fire for god you're not doing it right yeah especially like if you're already a believer and you're doing and you, you're you're claiming that you're a full-time believer to come to church the best the best church services that i've ever been to is when I spend the whole entire morning, the night before, the day before, just on fire because I've been so seeking him, so pressing and wanting and knowing and like just worshiping with God mm -hmm. and praying to God. And like I come to church and every word hits me like a beam. And then there's days when I do not spend time and I do not do anything. If you're not on fire when you walk through the building, the other flames is going to take time for you to become on fire. It takes time for you to light up. Tinder it. And then by the time you're on fire, the church service is almost over. Why not come in before flaming? It's the whole cultivation aspect. And do the different, the do, instead of you having to catch the fire, you making the fire be caught by other people. Yes. Like, let's switch this, this culture around. Like, don't come to church to get on fire. Bring the fire into the church. Yes. Church, you know? Church is not where we charge exactly sure. the bedroom is where we're charged. i had a question for closet. bogdan because you know we've been pretty good friends like i said for some time and he recently had a pretty big shift um as uh, he could say um in terms of his relationship with god um specifically after we went to kingdom domain together um you know we were sitting with i think it was vic fomenko and uh his brothers and he, they shared this thing about the whole carnal mind aspect and how flipping it off how has that been for you um this year ever since that one moment where you know you transition from this place of like study 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 scriptura and then you like barely have time with this like presence but you transition into a place where you just want to have time with the lord or a simple phrase that the lord kind of gave me is this the scripture should never substitute 
the actual communication with the author it should only confirm the actual author that you're speaking with i'm glad you brought that up i was trying to get into answer the first question you gave me was about how do we uh um, what kind of nuggets i could share to other people uh, who are trying to uh, who are trying to mentor or you know invest into somebody or plant seeds um and i've understood this concept but it didn't all tie in until um we had i guess i had the mis- not the missing piece of the puzzle but the revelation like the, like it clicked and made sense to me was when we, when we talked with the flamencos but essentially it goes with um i think it was paul who said it that our fight is not against flesh and bu- uh blood uh, it's not against flesh and blood, but against the spirits. The spirits of evil. Yeah. So whenever, you know, anybody's going through something or, you know, uh, whatever it is that we're coming against, to realize that that event or that wall that we're facing or that problem that we're facing, they're originating in the spiritual world. So if we try to fight, so is that if we're having trouble with the person or somebody's having trouble in a relationship or whatever it is, everybody automatically focuses on the person on the other person basically what they can see with their physical eyes and not realize that there's a spiritual world where the real fight's going on and when you're trying to relate to a human being who's going through something trouble forget the fact that you both are um you know like that he he's your, he's your buddy or that he's you know I'm trying to think of the correct words how to phrase it basically try to relate to that person in spirit Mm. put yourself in the shoes of that spirit not that human being wow. and when you relate to the fact that he's a spirit and you try to connect at a spiritual level then all of the earthly um, problems that will cloud your judgment and only make you focus on the physical things that you see with your physical eyes goes away and you realize yes. it's a spirit and you're trying to fight a spiritual battle and you're not trying to help Daniel as, as the nail that I one entity of yeah, but I'm trying to help the spirit realize that there's another spirit behind him mm. telling him to do one thing, and another spirit is trying to t- tell him to, this is what you should be doing, this is what's really going on. It's, uh, um, that That is what uh, last year kind of helped me understand. And then you, it's so easy to forget it, too, because you, you're, you're in this, I guess, lack of a better term, you're in this spiritual state where you're communicating with God, and you're elevated and you're not thinking about the earthly things around you and then the moment you leave you just get this complete bombardment of work bills you know shopping um school whatever it is and you slowly start disconnecting from the fact that there's a spiritual world and then that's when we put our guard down so it is really hard my best advice for that is maintain yourself in constant worship. That's what's helped me for, for almost a year now of being constantly present and not constantly like aware of mm. the spiritual sides of things. But we will continue this in uh, probably part two of yeah. a different podcast because I'm sure that nobody wants to listen to a three hour long podcast. Definitely. But part two, maybe in part three because Bogdan... Like I said, he you can talk about Bogdan all night, wisdoms. all day, all week, <laughs> and you'll never get tired of talking. Um, Bogdan, I do thank you, thank you so much for coming on to our podcast. Yes, thank we you honor guys you. For having me. Uh, we we love this. We love this this kind of discussion. We talked about so much good stuff that like really even like hits me personally because like I started off the podcast in the beginning it was just like, uh, and by by the middle I was like. I'm ready for more. <laughs> Let's go, guys. Yeah. And like Part two, by, coming up. By the end, go I'm ready. Like, well, what's next? Yeah, go deeper. Go deeper. Vlad's quote, bro. <laughs> yeah. So, guys, thank you so much for watching. Once again, if you guys are listening on YouTube, make sure you like and subscribe. If you guys are listening to Apple Podcasts, anything else like that, we are glad to have you. Leave a nice review or give us a testimony because we love to read your guys' testimonies. So, have a great day. Have a great night. Have a great evening. And we'll see you guys in the next one. Goodbye.